This week we are talking about John Adams, and we have another John joining us to talk about John Adams, who has written the book John Adams Alive, which I'm holding up right here. And in the beginning of your book, you do write about how you didn't really find him very appealing when you started your study. So what, how, how did you come back to Adams eventually to write it, his biography? Sure. I, well, I, I said when I didn't find him too appealing, I think what, what I was referring to is when I was maybe 19, 20 years old in uh, school, uh, I was assigned to read parts of Adams' diary. And I, I think the problem was more me than Adams's diary. I just couldn't get into it when I was 18 or 19 years old. But then um, I did a couple of books on war in early America. One was, one was a book uh, called uh, Wilderness of Misery, War and Warriors in Early America. And another was a biography of Washington. And I just kept running into John Adams in my research in both of those books and began to find him fascinating. And um, I also discovered that since Adams's papers had been uh, released, they, they were sequestered for a long time and they were released in about 60 reels of microfilm by the Massachusetts Historical Society um, sometime maybe in the 1960s or 70s. At any rate, since then, no one had done a one volume biography of Adams. In fact, the last one volume biography of Adams before I did mine had been done about 50 years earlier. So it's been so a long got, time coming. Yeah, right. I, so I got interested in, in Adams, um, found him a, a fascinating individual and also somebody who needed a one volume biography. And so uh, I decided after doing my book on Washington that I, I would do one on, on Adams. So my book on Washington came out in 1988 and the, and the biography of Adams four years later. And I, of course, I got to ask, I haven't seen it myself yet personally because I wanted to read your biography on it first, but have you seen the HBO, doc, not documentary, but the HBO series on John Adams? If so, what did you think of it? Yeah, the, uh, actually there have been two or three series done on Adams and uh, the one on HBO I thought was was fine. I, uh, I can't think of the, uh, the actor's name who, who portrayed Adams uh, right now, but he, he did a fantastic job. I think he really captured Adams. I might have, I can't remember the actress's name who played um, Abigail Adams. I, I might have chosen somebody else to, to play her, though I don't have anybody in mind right offhand. But I thought it was a very, very well done series. It was very accurate, and and uh, you can't say that about all all uh, programs done on historical mm -hmm. figures. But I but I like the one on Adams. It's let me see. I've tried to look it up now. It's Paul Giamatti. Oh, that's Adams. right. Yeah, that's that's right. Yes, he yes. always plays as least a lawyer, doesn't he? But this time he played something different, which is nice. Mm -hmm. No, sorry, yeah. not lawyer, but they always play a sleazy, sleazy agent or something. Uh huh. Well, he's Giamatti uh, has played a number of different roles. I've seen him in several several movies uh, before and after the the Adams show and. I was actually more familiar with his father. His father was com commissioner of baseball. And, really? Uh, yeah. So um, but any, anyway, they, they did a good job on that. There was one earlier that was done called the Adams Chronicles. And it was like a seven or eight parter. And it was done probably in the 1980s or so. And it, it was actually pretty well done uh, as well. But yeah, let's go back to Adams for, for now and focus on this life, which this episode is about. And you start writing about how the 17th and 18th century doesn't really change much in the terms of life of average American. So let's talk about the life of an average American in during Adams' lifetime in the 17th and 18th century, as you do open up within your book. Sure. Well, obviously, it would depend on... Uh 
what social class you were in and what occupation and 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 what race you were in. Very different if you were white than rather than being black at at that time. But uh, it, I mean, we we live in a time period that when change is just seems to me to be almost uh, overwhelming. You know, I I came along before computers and cell phones and mm. uh, and Zoom uh, that, <laughs> that we're, we're doing and whatever. So I've had to learn to do all of those, but. In the 18th century, I mean, Adams Adams lived to, to uh, 1826, actually. So he, he got a quarter of the way into the 19th century, but he was still, at the end, he was still traveling the way he had traveled when he was uh, a youngster. He was riding a horse. And um, so, you know, th there, there was no electricity and, and, uh, uh, things were made by hand. There, there wasn't much manufacturing uh, at the time. It was beginning in England, especially, and then then was beginning to spread over here during the last ten or fifteen years of Adams's life. But it was a time when when there really wasn't too much change technologically. But of course, Adams is part of the American Revolution. And the American Revolution does usher in a great deal of change, not only in America, but it becomes a, a worldwide uh, uh, event. Uh, you know, in, in the 1830s, uh, there was a, a commemoration of the first battle of the Revolutionary War, the first shots that were fired at Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775. And Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote a, a hymn called the Concord Hymn for, for that event. And it was both read and sung at the commemorative uh, ceremony. But at any rate, in, in his hymn, he speaks of the shots heard round the world. And that was true, I think, because before the Revolutionary War is, is over, England obviously is in, in it, but Spain and France and the new, neutral countries in Europe are uh, touched by it as well. And in turn, the, some of the changes that were unleashed by the revolution uh, had an impact uh, thousands of miles away from America uh, as well. So. so let's talk about Adam's upbringing and uh... He seems to me from I wouldn't I don't, that's probably not how they looked at it back in those days, but it seemed to me that he came from a rather middle class, not a fancy rich, noble noble nobility family, but it seemed to me that he wasn't poor either. So I would say he would did come from a sort of higher middle class family, didn't he? Well, I I would say uh, maybe middle middle class. I mean, his dad owned a, a small farm, and it was small. Um, most people in, in those days owned farms that were around 80 acres, and the Adams farm was about 40 acres. So it wasn't a very big farm, but they did grow some things and they marketed it. They made a little bit of money off of it. But then Adams's father, who was called Deacon Adams, in the in the winter time when he couldn't grow uh, crops, uh, was a shoemaker. And he did that to supplement his income. And I think largely um, he did it so that he could send one of his sons to college. Yeah, and it was very he, important of that, wasn't he? It was very important to him that they get educated quite well. That's, that's right. And he, he Deacon Adams and, and Adams's, John Adams's mom agreed that they would try to send the eldest son to college, they didn't have money to. They were, the Adams had two brothers, but they didn't have the money to send all three of the boys to to college. So they agreed that they would send the eldest son to college, and John was the the eldest son. And I think his father used the money that he made uh, making shoes, supplementing the income of the family. Uh, that that was what he used to send John to to Harvard. So John, John was fortunate in being the, the eldest one because his, uh, I mean, he, he not only w was educated and then went on to his public career, but 
His two brothers remained just uh, small farmers uh, right there where they were, were raised outside of, of Boston. Hmm. So what, what, what was what so attractive about studying law? It seems that most founding fathers did come from a law graduate, you know, Hamilton among others, Jefferson, I believe. There's a lot of Washington too, I think, if, if I remember correctly. Most of the founding fathers come from law education. So what was, what made law so attractive to Adams and the rest of the founding fathers in that matter? To, that made the law attractive? Is that, yeah, to study, yeah. to study law yeah. and to study. Yeah, well, I, I think in, in uh, Ad, well, I mean, probably in, in all of their cases, it uh, becoming a lawyer was an avenue to a public career. And I think Adams uh, really wanted to, to uh, gain some notoriety. His, his father had been an important person, maybe the most important figure in that small town of Braintree where, where John Adams was raised. And Adams wanted to be uh, an important figure too, more important even than his father. And, and um, uh, back early on in the 17th and early part of the 18th century, in New England, the, the route to notoriety was primarily to become a preacher, mm -hmm. and and that be, and, and and lawyers began to surpass uh, uh, ministers uh, uh, in notoriety, probably around the middle of the the 18th century, and then particularly as the uh, as the troubles with England uh, developed lawyers really went into the forefront and and so Adams saw that as as an as an opportunity if he if he became a lawyer uh, then he he was going to to become somebody so he decided his mother talked to him about maybe becoming a physician and uh, he he didn't care for for that at, at all and um, uh, so he he studied uh, law and, uh, uh, and, and, and I think one of the things that really impressed me about Adams is that there were no law schools in America at, at, in those days. You, you could go to London and study in a law school, but not in, not in the colonies. And so uh, the way one became a lawyer was to simply apprentice under uh, somebody who was already licensed to practice law. And Jefferson did that, and Hamilton did that, and, and John Adams and others uh, did that as well. And but but it Martin, wasn't for more, sorry, sorry, Dad, but it wasn't for more moral reasons that Adams decided to study law. It was purely for fame, mostly. Um, well, I think he was. I think he was intellectually curious, and he wanted to uh, to learn the law. But I, I do think it, it was ambition that uh, that that drove him. I mean, later on in another context, he he talks about that he's thinking of himself and uses a a biblical uh, passage, and he says, "Vanity, vanity, all is vanity." And so I, I think his vanity, his, his desire to, to become somebody moves him in that direction. And I, I think you can say that about all of the, the founders, Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, all of the others, I, I think were also driven, uh, at least in part, to, to gain notoriety. Certainly they had other things on their mind too, but, but that was a big, big component of it. So, let, so let's let's talk, talk about him. How how does he study job? Is it does he study it hard? Is it focus purely focus on study, or does he just do like any other college student would do? I suppose. Yeah, well, he he goes to Harvard, and he's a pretty good student at Harvard, and he talks some in his autobiography about the uh, the people that he. So the other fellows that he associated with at Harvard and um, and 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 Jefferson did the same thing too in in, in reminiscing 
about the the fellows, his fellow students that he he associated with at William and Mary uh, uh, College. And in both cases, they they said they they tended they tended to gravitate toward those who were better students and more serious students. That there were a lot of students who were there just playing around and not not very interested in in studying and education. But but so basically Adam, frat boys. Yeah, right. Something like that. I don't think they had fraternities, <laughs> but that was it was something like that. But Adams. Adams's friends were the were the the um, uh, the more serious uh, students, and uh, and I, I started to mention too a, a minute ago that that one of the things that really impressed me about Adams was that after he finished his legal apprenticeship, um, most of the people once they finished that that was it. They didn't study any any longer they just started practicing law but Adams kept right on studying he he went into Boston and he met the four most prestigious lawyers in um, heavily competitive Boston and he asked them for advice and they gave him advice you need to read this you need to read that you need to do this you need to do that and Adams followed their advice and he continued studying and Jefferson did the same thing. So that, that once they really did begin to, uh, to practice the law, they, they were pretty accomplished um, from, from the beginning. And of course, with experience, they grew even more accomplished. Of course, oratory is something you need to be doing that if you are, are going to be a lawyer. So was that you an orator as well? Um, well, I think he, he wasn't a great lawyer uh, orator uh, on the order of somebody like Patrick Henry, for example. But I think he honed his skills as an orator by addressing juries over the years. You know, he would, in cases, he would have to argue before juries, and and uh, uh, and and I think he 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 gradually became a better orator and. In the debate on the Declaration of Independence on July 3rd, 1776, uh, Adams made a very long, passionate speech, and some of the some of the congressmen uh, declared that it was the best speech that they had ever heard. So, so I think based on that, he did probably become uh, um, a, a pretty good orator. Again, not not on the order of Patrick Henry, but. Uh, certainly better than than probably most. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there is a woman he meets at this time too, right? If it, but it doesn't go so well with her, if I remember correctly. Uh, yes, he well he he he, uh, he dated uh, before he met Abigail Adams, uh, Abigail Smith actually, before they were married. He he did date. Um, a woman and and it, it just didn't go anywhere and he was was uh, sad uh, as as a result of that but probably things worked out well for him he he met Abigail Smith he couldn't have had a better partner than Abigail Adams she she was uh, uh, intellectually curious herself and and she she was ambitious for John's ambition, and so it turned out to be just an extraordinary match. So let's talk about him, him meeting Abigail. Abigail, how do they meet? And as we're coming back to that, I'm sure. But it seemed you say that it was the ten first years that was arguably the best, the best years of the marriage. So what changes after this, the ten years? But let's first begin with how they met. Well, they they lived close to one another, and her father was a minister, and I, I'm not sure exactly where they they met, but um, you know, I mean, they 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 lived in proximity to one another, so they were probably destined to meet. And then he he began a courtship uh, of her, and we know what what happened. They, they wound up. Uh, uh, then getting married after a, a courtship. I forget exactly how long 
uh, they actually, he actually courted her somewhere in the neighborhood of a year or so before, before they, they married. And he married, he married, by the way, fairly late at the time that, that, that men who were, who did not go to college and went to work as soon as they uh, grew up. The, those men in, in at this time period in the 18th century, on average, tend to marry when they were about 21 or 22 years old, and the women tended to marry on average when they were about 19, 18 or 19 years old. But John Adams was around 28 when he was married, which was the same for George Washington and uh, and Thomas Jefferson. So I, I think in all, all of them had their eyes on the on the future and on on they were ambitious and they wanted to to get things out of the way before they got married and in Adams's case I think he wanted to to study law and begin practicing law and to to have his feet on the ground and and have the ability to to support uh, a family. Families tended to be pretty large in those days. He, yeah, there was a large that that's rate at that time, wasn't it? Right. He he wound up with um, four children, three three that lived. A couple couple didn't live to adulthood, but he he wound up with um, with three sons and and a daughter. So he had four four children. Which was not at all an, an, an uncommon size for a family in those days. What were Smiths a good family to marry into for for Adam for the Adams? Was it a higher upper class than the Adams themselves, or was it a, no more or less the same class as they were? Probably just slightly higher class. Her father, Abigail's father, was a, a, a minister. He was better formally educated than Deacon Adams uh, was, and he he was uh, would have been he wouldn't have been really well known outside of the community that he lived in, but he would have been uh, an important figure, maybe the most important figure in that community. Although, no, all, all, no, all those, no. yeah, although as I, as I said earlier. Um, people in secular positions, people who were lawyers or people who held government offices or whatever, were beginning to surpass uh, ministers in um, in in esteem. No, well, sorry, I was throwing off. I was going to say that there for a second, but. He does, he does travel a lot too because of his work, doesn't he? So he isn't really doesn't really have much time. And this, of course, out later in the years as well, but he doesn't really have too much time to spend with his family, does he? That's, that's right. I mean, he, every place in America, not just in Massachusetts, but every place, the, the lawyers rode the circuit, as they said. Uh, they were on horseback and they traveled from county to county and each county would have a week in which the court was in session. So Adams would go to that county and handle cases during that week and then move on to another county and handle the cases there and then move on again. Now, it wasn't over 12 months, but uh, it, it took up several months during the year. So. Um, he he was absent from from his from his wife and family for a good portion of the time, and um, um, not not as much as would be the case once he gets into public life and goes to Congress. But um, it was just one of the things that went with his with his career. Mm. And same for, same for Jefferson, by the way, too. He he rode the the circuit and Jefferson met his wife, in fact, while he was riding the circuit. He, did, Unlike John and Abigail Adams, Jefferson and his wife did not live close to one another. So he met her when he was riding the circuit. Hmm. So let's talk about the American, the Stamp Act and the Boston massacre, which would later occur. and. After, after the Boston massacre, Adams actually defends 
the soldiers. So how how was this viewed by the by the local? I'm I'm gonna call them Americans here. How was this viewed that he, and how does well does it defend the so British soldiers yeah. after the Boston massacre? Well, I I think probably with mixed emotions. I mean, there were certainly radicals like Samuel Adams, who who in fact was instrumental in getting John Adams to represent the soldiers. He, he, he was convinced that nobody could win the case um, and that the, the, the soldiers would be convicted. And so, um, and then, then everybody could say, well, they had a, a fair trial. They had, had maybe the best lawyer in Boston and John Adams defending them. But, but there were other people who felt that Adams should not uh, have, have defended uh, the soldiers. But Adams, of course, took the position that, that most lawyers today take, and that is that everybody is entitled to representation and to a fair trial. And so he, he felt obligated to, to do that. And, um, and he made almost no money off of, uh, of defending uh, those, those soldiers. But it, it was something that gained some notoriety for him and he felt that he was obligated to, uh, to do so as, as well. It wasn't frowned upon more or less that he defended the Brits who they were fighting against? Well, by, by some. I mean, remember they hadn't, the war had not yet begun. The, 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 the Boston massacre. But still, it was a massacre, though, of local people, of civilians, right? So it was right. Have been... yeah, right. The British fired into a, a crowd of protesters, and five people were killed. Five Bostonians were killed uh, in in that episode. But but this occurs about five years before the war breaks out. Mm. So there's a great deal of tension with, with uh, Britain at the time, because as you mentioned, the, the Stamp Act and Townsend duties and, and the other things that were, that were inflaming the situation. But, but it is five years before the war begins and, and no one knows that a war is going to occur. They know there's trouble with England, but they don't know where it's leading. And um, so uh, it's, it's not a case of, of him really defending soldiers from the enemy he he is still he's defending soldiers from the parent state from the mother country hmm. so of course that's what's what does it do in between the before the revolution between the after the boston massacre and event and the revolution what is going on in the in what i would call the in between years yeah he's he's uh well he's just practicing law in uh, in continuing what he had done before, and he doesn't get into politics until the Boston Tea Party takes place, and then in the aftermath of the of the Boston Tea Party, the British uh, punish Boston, and the colonists respond to that punishment with the Continental Congress. And John Adams was selected largely because of Samuel Adams as one of Massachusetts's uh, four delegates to the Continental Congress. And so he goes there with really no political experience. He, he had served one short term in the Massachusetts Assembly. He didn't like it. Uh, he felt that it was a waste of time. He felt that that uh, the radicals were stirring up uh, trouble that need not be stirred up. And so he has, he's really a political novice when he, when he goes to uh, the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia in the fall of 1774. So how does the Philadelphia Congress go for Adams? Yeah, the, well, the, 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 con the, I, I think what happens is wh when, the, when the Boston Tea Party occurs, uh, the British immediately wanted to punish Boston and Massachusetts uh, for, for the Tea Party. And, and um, 
a lot of, I mean, what, what today would be several million dollars worth of private property belonging to the East India Tea Company had been destroyed in that. So they wanted retribution. And um, the, um, the, 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 uh, all of the colonies had to decide, how are we going to respond? Are we going to let Massachusetts hang out here alone? And, and, or are we going to help them? Mm -hmm. and, and I think by this time, a great many people could see that war was on the horizon. And so they wanted to have a Congress and try to weigh their response to Britain's response. Um, and they also wanted to try to determine whether uh, there was enough unity among the 13 colonies uh, that they could go to war. If, I mean, Massachusetts couldn't fight Britain alone and three or four colonies couldn't fight Britain alone. All 13 colonies had to hang together. And they didn't have much contact with one another in the colonial period. They looked across the Atlantic to Britain and, and didn't travel much from one colony to another, didn't cooperate on things. So they really, people in Massachusetts didn't know very much about people from New Jersey. People in New Jersey didn't know very much about people in Georgia and whatever. So, so they wanted to have a Congress they could get to know one another and, and if war came, determine whether or not there would be a united front. So that, that was why the Continental Congress actually um, came about. So of course, let's talk about the revolution itself. And we're not going to go to too much in depth on it. We made an episode a while ago with Professor Woody Holton about the American Revolution. So if you want mm -hmm. to go check it out in more depth there, I would highly recommend it. But let's talk about Adam's role and focus on Adam's role during the revolution because he doesn't become a soldier, does he? And why does he, is there a reason why he chooses not to become a soldier during, during the revolutionary, sorry, revolutionary war, sorry. Well, he, he was in his early 40s when the war broke out. So, um, I mean, yeah. as, as general rule, the Continental Army took men between the ages of, of 17 and 50. And men were obligated to serve in the militia between the ages of 16 and 60. So technically, he was of military age, but he was pretty old to be a soldier and he, he had never soldiered before. Actually heart in Massachusetts, Harvard graduates were exempt from militia service. So he, had, he, he in fact, Adams in fact says, I'm the first member of my family never to have, have soldiered. And he said that with, I mean, seemed to be with some, some regret. So uh, he didn't soldier. He, he went to Congress. He stays in Congress for three years, from 1774 until 1777. And then thereafter, he plays a role as a diplomat. He's sent to Europe, makes two trips, actually, to Europe, and um, is a diplomat during the last four or five years yeah. of, the, of the war. I'm, so, I'm sorry for stopping you there, but let's talk about the Europe trip for a little bit and his diplomatic mission to France, among other things. Because as you mentioned in your book, he learned French. He decides that he's going to be to sent to France. And he's worried about this farm as well. He doesn't want to take his family with him either, which is kind of understandable like, if he loses his farm. And he leaves... So why does it choose to take his son, John Quincy Adams, with him? Yeah, I, th I think he took, uh, his, actually, he wound up taking a couple of his sons over, ultimately, to, to Europe. And I, I think he thought they would benefit from, from the experience. They would see European culture. Maybe they, they could study some when they were, were in Europe, um, gaining the experience of, of having been a world traveler and, and meeting important people in Europe might be important in in uh, in their careers down the road. So he took them, but he but he didn't take Abigail, his wife, uh, and, and for two reasons. One was 
it was obviously dangerous in wartime to sail across the Atlantic. A lot of people were captured, including one of, um, of Adams's colleagues as a diplomat, Henry Lawrence from South Carolina, was captured and imprisoned in London and spent about a year or so imprisoned in London. So Adams was, was on the one hand, I think, worried that Abigail might be captured. And who knows what seamen might do to a woman that they, that they, they captured. So I mean, he just thought that that was, was, was just too dangerous. And he, I think he was probably right about that. But also, he didn't want to lose the farm. Uh, again, he, he didn't have a crystal ball. He didn't know what was coming down the road. Uh, I think probably at that point, he presumed he'd go back and practice law when the, the war was over, but he might be up in his 50s by then. And so the, the farm provided some economic security uh, for, the, for the family. But you have to pay taxes uh, to keep that, that property. And so they had to have an income. And so Abigail stays at home and she manages the farm and sees that the crops that are grown are marketed and sees that the laborers that she hired to work the farm are, are paid and, and whatever. And, and she wasn't alone. I mean, there were, there were many, many women whose husbands went off to war, either in the Continental Army or in the militia, who became what what one historian called a deputy husband mm -hmm. that is you know she she took the husband's place and managed the the, the the family's finances and managed the property and and whatever so so that was why adams didn't didn't take her along yeah. and, and it was the same in norway at the time too i was read, read a book on history of norway for a while ago and it was the same situation there because men went out fishing a lot and they, they were out for weeks perhaps and uh, she became the sort of the husband of the family back home in norway as well so it was more or less the same situation back here 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 too so it wasn't much difference there but let's talk about the sea journey over to Europe because it it wasn't like taking a plane where you're just eight hours and you're there. It was several weeks at the time, and steam engines wasn't even invented yet. So how, how it wasn't quite wasn't an easy journey to put it mildly to go to Europe. That's right. It's, it's obviously a potentially dangerous journey, even in peacetime, because you could run into into storms and. And anything could, you know, the ship could capsize or whatever. And in wartime, there was always a danger of being captured by the, the enemy. And it was a long trip. I, I think the, the fastest known trip across the Atlantic, at least from England to the colonies, was something like 22 or 23 days. Mm. That, was, that was the fastest. It's not an easy fleet. It looked like a plane flight today, in other words. Right. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's the the average trip probably took somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty nine or thirty days, and some took much longer. Thomas Paine um, made a, a return trip from France in seventeen eighty one back to Philadelphia, and it took ten weeks to make the the trip. That's that's, that's seventy days at sea. So that's that's a long, long, uh, mm. long, long time. And when it is in France, it, it also took a while to, because, uh, as, when, as you know, it wasn't the same carriages. Carriages took also a while to get to Paris as well. It wasn't just a day's ride, I imagine, to get from the coast into Paris, right? Yeah, that, that's right. He, well, he makes two trips, as I said. And on the second trip, uh, they had trouble uh, with, the, with, the, with the ship. It was leaking and... Everybody, every passenger, including Adams, had to take their turn going down manning pumps to pump the water out. And so they had to get to, to port as quickly as they could because of the ship's instability. And they wound up uh, docking in Spain. And then Adams went by horseback from Spain across the Pyrenees Mountains into, into France. His first voyage went directly to to France. So um, 
So sailing was an adventure. You never knew what was was going to happen. And, and, on, and on one of the on one of the trips, they did actually spot uh, an an enemy ship, and uh, fortunately they were able to to lose that ship and get away, and and nobody was hurt, and and there there wasn't any kind of a battle that took place. And of course, it does write a lot to Abigail as well while he is in Europe, but it, but she doesn't write quite as much back to him, which was kind of depressing to Adams, right? That she, she didn't write as much, he didn't get much as replies back before. Yeah. But I, considering it, the amount of time, as we discussed, that it took to cross the ocean, it must have been taken at least two months before you could get a letter back, though. Yeah, it was a it was a long time. I mean, he if he wrote a letter, her response was probably two, anywhere in the neighborhood of eight to ten weeks later uh, before he he actually received uh, her response. But I I, sh I should say that that Adams was, was really a marvelous letter writer. That he it, when he prepared public documents. Uh, or tried to write pamphlets, they're pretty deadly. They're all it's very difficult to read. But as a letter writer, uh, he, he was almost unmatched. Jefferson was the same way. Washington was not so good um, in, in that respect. But he wasn't bad, but not, not quite as good. So reading the correspondence between John and Abigail Adams is, is really a good experience and just seeing what they went through and and um, and the the ups and downs and their their spirits i mean at, at one point mid, mid several points during the war abigail writes and she says her her patriotism is almost gone i mean she's so so disconsolate because her husband is gone i mean she's she doesn't see her husband for five years mm. and she calls herself a widow at one point because she hasn't seen him for, for a long time. She wants to see him. She thinks her children at home need to have their father there with them. And, and of course, nobody knows how the war is going to turn out. And I, it, I believe you, sorry, sorry interrupting you there, but I do, do believe you mentioned this as well in, in your biography that he, he when he returned, the kids doesn't recognize him anymore. He's like a stranger. To that's them. right. That's right. Yeah, it'd been years since since they had had seen him, and and if the war isn't won, then all of this sacrifice is for nothing. I mean, they're gonna if the war isn't won, they're gonna still be part of the British Empire as they were before the war uh, began. So it, it was a heavy burden for um, for for both of them, and and I think heavier really for for Abigail. Because John was, I mean, he was in the middle of a lot of exciting things, uh, interacting with French diplomats and uh, Spanish diplomats and and uh, and and other important diplomatic figures from America, such as Benjamin Franklin, and um, so it's 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 a more difficult experience, I think, for Abigail, but. But I, I'm not. I'm not saying that it wasn't difficult for John. Mm. It, it must have been hard to be a woman in those days, especially if we be married to men like Adams, and you had to be incredibly strong, I imagine, to be able to cope with the absence and be and take it, being in control while the while the men are gone. Yeah, and and not not every man would do it. I mean, Jefferson was asked to go to Europe on a diplomatic mission. And he wouldn't leave his wife. Uh, so, I mean, he felt that his place was there with her and, and with the family. And granted, she, she was in much more delicate health than Abigail Adams was, but he, he was with her. And even George Washington, uh, off at war, his, when the army would go into winter quarters for about six months, during the year, Martha Washington would come to camp and live with with George. So he was separated from his wife for about six months out of the year. But the other six months they were together, and John and Abigail are separated for five years. Mm. Kind of like 
I would try to draw a similarity here to the Odyssey when Odysseus is gone for 10 years, in mm -hmm. a sense. Yeah, right. That's right. But, but yeah, uh, so he, we can't go, go through everything, unfortunately. And But we don't have to go to after the revolution. And like you said, if they lost, it would all be for nothing. But fortunately, they didn't lose. They won the revolution. So what? How did what what is Adam's return to America like when after they won the colonies? And what is is what does it take from his experience in Europe? Yeah, he well after the war, he's he's uh, named the American ambassador to Great Britain. So he's in London for a few years, and while he's there, the Constitution is written and ratified, and the new national government's being set up. And so when Adams returns, uh, he, he wants an important place in the, in the new government. And he's pretty much assured. I mean, he knows that George Washington is going to be the first president. That's undisputed. But Adams pretty much assumes that he will be the vice president under Washington. And that's, that's what uh, works out. So he, he comes back uh, to the country and in the first election in 1789, he is elected vice president. And he, he spends eight years as Washington's vice president. You know, it was a, a powerless office. Adams was, was disappointed. And um, uh, it was just, he, he felt like it was wasted time. Now, he is it's not really, it was boring, quite boring. As I said, it was a waste of time and it was, Bore, like you said, bore really boring. It wasn't like being vice president today at all. It was quite different. So, what was the job of a vice president really in that time? Yeah, he well, he when he becomes president, he's he. he there are some similarities uh, in the 1790s and today. As a vice president, I mean, well, well it's. It, it, they're similar in the sense that uh, both the 1790s and our time, there was there were great divisions, political divisions. It was a highly partisan time period. One historian years and years ago referred to the 1790s as an age of passion, and it, and it was. It, it, there there have been other times in American history, particularly in the 1850s leading down to the Civil War in the 1960s, and maybe in the 1960s uh, when the Vietnam War protests are going on, you have other tempestuous uh, decades, but, but they're fairly rare in American history. But this was a difficult time period, and Adams's party, the Federalist Party, splits. It divides over over the policies that, that Adams is pursuing. There, there's a, Adams inherits a war scare with France. And there are many people in, in his party who looked on France as, I mean, this is France of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And they look on France as, as dangerous and radical. And they want to see the French Revolution. These are conservatives who want to see the French Revolution destroyed. Um, and they thought it could perhaps be destroyed if the United States joined with Britain in a war with the French. And Adams did not want another war. He didn't think the United States as a united country could survive another war, that the country would split apart, divide, and the United States would be history. So he, he resisted war and walked the extra mile for peace, trying diplomatic uh, maneuvers to secure an accommodation with France. And the result was that, that he, his party really divided and many members of his own party detested, and especially Alexander Hamilton detested Adams for his policies. But I think it, it, was, it was crucial for Adams and, and he called it the, his crown jewels that he succeeded in avoiding war with France in the 1790s. And I, I agree with him. I, I think while he was not a great president, 
it, it was greatness on his part that he did not take the United States into um, into a war with with France. I think the country would have just divided so badly that the United States would would probably not have survived. Something I want to talk about while he's I believe during his vice presidency is when he is uh, you know he want he does get something out of Europe and he wants more or less a royal title that he wants the long royal title for the president like your high great highness I don't remember exact title but it's kind of mocked during by by him that he wants this prestigious title right it's he just mocked for that right he was ridiculed for for that and and probably justly so but remember he had just spent about a dozen years in Europe he had been around european diplomats he saw how how uh, they acted and and were tr- were treated and and i think what he was just trying to do was add dignity to the united states and um i, I think it was misguided on his part but that that's what he was was trying to do but, but you have to remember too that adams is very conservative he's not not a democrat small d they're not i'm not talking about democratic party but a believer in democracy he feared democracy and he he wanted a republican form of government a representative form of government but he wanted all kinds of checks and balances uh built in did he want to, more a proletariat in a sense not well um I, I he certainly believed in in congress and believed in in elected assemblies who who made laws but he did think that the executive whether you called it a president or talking about a governor and a state or whatever he did feel that they should be um that they should have a considerable amount of of power uh so that they could check what the what the elected representatives did and this is he as he read history he was convinced that uh throughout history republican governments and especially democratic governments uh did not last very long and that uh, they de- degenerated into mob rule and then into into chaos and and i think he was trying to prevent something like that from um, from occurring so but I, i and and many people at the time accused him of being a monarchist i don't think he i don't think he wanted a monarchy for the united states he had after all been a revolutionary against king george the 3 uh he he applauded parts of thomas paine's common sense that attacked the idea of of monarchy but he did want a strong executive and he thought the president should have a great deal of power i think i think he would if he could come back today and see how much power the president actually does possess uh adams would be ex- extremely pleased by that hmm. something i wanted to talk about as well and this is kind of highlighted in chernow's ron chernow's hamilton his biography and him that he there there's hostility between hamilton and adams and but as cherno mentioned hamilton actually wanted to vote for adams but at john adams they misunderstand this and that is how the hostility happened do you do you agree with this or do you do, yeah, what do you I, think yeah I, i i think there i mean it was a strained relationship and that's putting it mildly i think but the the two wound up really hating one another and and i think there there are two things going on there one is that um uh hamilton was a um uh, he, he loved great britain and he wanted to move the united states closer to great britain and away and away from from france Hamilton and, too was uh, was uh, accused of being a mon- being a monarchist. Um yes he was. I mean he made a speech at the constitutional convention that, that was sort of pointed in uh in in that direction. 
The other thing is that that Hamilton um, knew that, I mean, John Adams was the type of person who just could not be controlled by anybody. He was his own man. He was going to make up his own mind. He was going to do what he, he wanted to do. Uh, he, nobody could manipulate him. And Hamilton wanted to be the power behind the throne. I think, especially, especially as, as George Washington got older, uh, Hamilton was was able to manipulate Washington to a certain degree. I, I, I'm not. I, I wouldn't say by any stretch of the imagination that that ha that Washington was a puppet of Hamilton, but he could persuade Washington in many cases to do this or do that. But he couldn't do that with Adams. Adams was very independent, and um, so the result was uh, Hamilton did not like Adams. He, he wanted somebody in there uh, in place of Adams who uh, that he could manipulate. So let's talk about Adams' presidency. And you said that he goes to great length, as you mentioned, that his uh, for diplomatically neutrality and that he did agree that war was would be the downfall of the United States. But there is one event that kind of a little bit amusing to me when the students come to his doorsteps and has talked about how his behavior to that's kind of embarrassing to Abigail as well. Now, you're, you're talking about when they were really late in his life, when the West uh, Point students? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one they refer to, yeah. Uh, okay, well, that, that was just very late in, in life. He, he only had a few months left to live, and... Um, the, the Corps of Cadets at, at West Point came up to Boston and they while they were there, they marched out to Quincy where the Adams homestead was located. And they, they came to visit Adams and Adams came out on the steps and, and made really what was his last public appearance. And in that appearance, uh, he, he tells them to, that they should try to emulate George Washington, that George Washington should be their model as a soldier. So many people felt that, that Adams disliked Washington, but I, I think that's, that's an exaggeration. He had some trouble. They disagreed on some things, but by and large, he admired Washington and certainly admired Washington as a soldier and as a leader and someone who did who never who did not abuse the power uh, that that he had. Now, what would you say was the legacy of John Adams? Well, I I think his his legacy is uh, uh, that more than than anything. I mean, I, I don't think there's any one thing because he he has such a long career. And I, I think he does uh, three things in his career that uh, his public career that that's really important. One is that he was really the leader in Congress in the fight for independence. Congress was deeply divided. It didn't declare independence until the war had been going on for 15 months. And Adams, during those 15 months, is the leader in the fight for independence. And he, of course, obviously wins that fight and, and independence is declared in 76. The second thing is that Adams turns out, I think, to be an extremely good diplomat. Um, he, he winds up securing a much needed loan from Holland in 1782. He's in part of the peace talks leading to the final peace treaty and secures uh, uh, good boundaries for the United States and, and other things in those uh, negotiations. And then I think the third thing is that in a sense, by, by keeping the United States neutral and not going to war during his presidency, not going to war with France, he, he really plays a major role in the preservation of the United States. So th those three things, I think, are his, his legacies. 
Right, and something again I want to bring it, bring this up that Cherno as well talked about is when the revolution of France happened. The the deal with France was with the monar monarchist France, right? And then there is a lot of disputed with this in Congress with whether they should, you know, the deal is the deal still applying to Napoleonic France, or should they kind of renew? The deal with France should it just fall out with France because there's not the same France as with under the Bourbons, right? So there, there is a lot of dispute with this. The, the deal they had with France while they they helped them out during the revolution, it's not really the same France that it was before the French Revolution, and there's a lot of dispute about this. Yeah, that that's right. I mean, the and and Americans were were really divided. They the many Americans. Um, loved Louis the Sixteenth because he he had befriended the the uh, uh, the Americans during the Revolution, provided money for them, a navy for them, a, an army for them, and and so many Americans were were saddened that Louis the Sixteenth wound up going to the guillotine during the uh, during the French Revolution. Then then it, the in the reign of terror. French Revolution is very bloody, and and the more conservative Americans turn against France uh, at at that point, and and want nothing to to do with with France, and then it winds up under an in a, uh, under an autocrat in uh, in Napoleon. So that that I mentioned earlier that this this time period has been called an age of passion in referring to, to American politics. And I think more than anything, what, what caused it to be such a passionate uh, time period is because of what's going on in France and the relationship between the United States and the, and the French, but, but also because people recognize that whatever decisions were made in the 1790s would be very difficult to ever overturn. I mean, you, 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 they just become kind of uh, uh, carved in, in stone. So these are very, very crucial decisions that are being made all through the, the 1790s. Thank you so much for coming on. And if you want to go more in depth on John Adams, I absolutely recommend that you should read his book, John Adams and Life, which I'm holding up right here. And before I go, where do you have anything you want to promote? Where can people find your books if they are interested in learning more about Adams, which I hope you are? And do you have any links you want me to put in the description of this episode? Yeah, I, I just would, would like to, to remind listeners or inform listeners that they can go to my website, which is just johnferling.com, and uh, you can see things about what I've published since the Adams book, and uh, probably learn more about me than you want to know. <laughs> so, uh, so, but it's just johnferling.com. So I've enjoyed it today, and I want to thank you for having me on with you. It was my pleasure. It was an honor to talk with you, and uh, this has been what that is as well. We are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you can find the podcast these days. If you are on Apple Podcasts, please consider writing a little review of the podcast if you like this episode. That's I do highly recommend checking out more episodes that we have. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.